All right, hello, hello, and welcome back to lesson three for unit three, area studies three. That's a lot of threes, Australia in the world economy, uh, where today we're going to start looking at net foreign debt and the terms of trade. We're going to do something a little bit different at the start of today's lesson after we go through the key knowledge and success criteria by kind of recapping the balance of payments stuff that we talked about last lesson with a little bit of a practice question, some multiple choice around that to just make sure that all of that is really fresh in people's mind. Bear with me, hopefully this will still be good, exciting. I'm feeling pumped up. I've only had four hours sleep because we had the year 12 formal last night and I'm going to try and persevere and get this video to the highest quality I possibly can. So our key knowledge today is the composition and cause of net foreign debts and net foreign equities. It's gonna be super simple. It's one of the things that's it's mainly definitional. Um, you just need to know what they are and what changes in the mean. Then we've got the terms of trade, its meaning and its measurement and the factors that may affect the terms of trade, including commodity prices and production costs in trading partners. So the terms of trade students historically find really difficult. So we're gonna try and break it down as simply as possible to hopefully make it something, an area where you can just absolutely destroy it on exams because historically students have not answered those questions well. So our learning intention for this topic is to understand how global transactions impact living standards in Australia, specifically through net foreign debt, net foreign equities, and the terms of trade at the moment. And your success criteria for today is that you can describe the cause of net foreign debt and net foreign equities, and you can explain how changes to the terms of trade will impact on aggregate demand. But before we do all of that, we're gonna to start to recap last lesson. So last lesson, we talked about the current account balance, the balance of payments, the current account, being made up of net goods, net services, net primary incomes, net secondary incomes, and wondering how changes in that will affect whether it's a current account surplus or a current account deficit. So if we were to look at a sample question around that and how you go about answering that, it could be something like this. A lot of the time you get essentially a factor and how does X factor impact the current account balance? So in this instance, we have explain how an appreciation of the exchange rate could impact Australia's current account balance for three marks. All your explaining questions in economics tend to be around three marks, unless you're also defining a goal, in which case sometimes they push out to four. So if you had this question, you could break down into what the three marks are relatively simply. Firstly, it's always going to be explain what it means by that changing factor. So we've got a changing factor here, an appreciation of the exchange rate. So you have to say what that actually means for that first mark. So describe an appreciation of the exchange rate. Then, because we're talking about the current account balance, the second mark comes in outlining how a sub-account could be impacted with reference to credits and debits. And then your last mark comes from how the current account balance is impacted overall. So if we broke that down into a sample answer and step-by-step, -step, describing the appreciation of the exchange rate is an appreciation of the exchange rate refers to the value of the Australian dollar rising compared to foreign currencies. And then how a sub-account could be affected, an appreciation of the exchange rate will make imports cheaper for Australian households, which increases the debits in net goods and services accounts, while also decreasing the demand for Australian exports as they become more expensive for our trading partners, which decreases credits in the net goods and services. So it's a lot more for that one mark, but mentions clearly debits and credits. So this increase in debits relation to credits means that the current account balance is likely to move towards a deficit or the surplus will decrease overall. I like this point at the end about moving towards a deficit or decreasing the surplus overall, because what that means is if you've not been given a situation where you know what the current account balance is, it gives you both scenarios really clearly. If you know that we're in a surplus and we'll just make it smaller, you can just say decrease the value of the current account surplus, but this way you're really hedging your bets. Then to get into a multiple choice that we can practice. So in the balance of payments, if the current account deficit was negative $45, and the capital account was $60, which of the following statements must be true? And there's a lot going on there to break down very quickly. So as we know, if we are looking at the balance of payments, so if we've got the balance of payments here, on one side we have the current account, and on the other side we have the capital and financial account. What we know is they all have to cancel out to equal zero overall. So if the current account is negative 45, and the capital account is 60, we need to work out what's gonna make this zero out. So basically we need to make sure that this side equals positive 45, because then it is gonna cancel out that negative 45 and it'll be zero overall. So that means the financial account must be negative 15. And then we can find that in responses. So the financial account must be negative 15. Boom, we're all good. Um, happy days, we can carry on. Another practical multiple choice question is the cyclical component of the current account 
is best described as. And then we've got to remember that what's happening with the cyclical part of the CAD. Well, the current account in times of increasing aggregate demand, the current account balance tends to fall or move to more towards the current account deficit. And in times of falling aggregate demand, the current account balance tends to rise or going to a larger surplus. And why that is, is in when there's increasing aggregate demand, uh, people tend to borrow more money, invest more, and therefore create more liabilities for us, and also spending spills over onto imports. So when we look at our four options here, the part of the CAD that rises during periods of weak economic growth and falls during um, periods of strong economic growth. We've got the part of the CAD that rises and falls during periods of weak economic growth. So we can rule that one out straight away. The part of the CAD that falls during periods of weak economic growth and rises during periods of strong economic growth and the part that blah, blah, blah. So C is the correct answer there based on our overall logic. So we get into the new content for today. So net foreign debt, what net foreign debt is, is the balance of funds owed by Australia to overseas nations compared to the funds nations owe Australia. A lot of students make a silly mistake here of thinking net foreign debt is only what we owe other countries. It's also what they owe us. It's the balance of the two. So you always need to have both of those things to achieve full marks in any kind of discussion about net foreign debt. So measuring net foreign debt is that there are two main parts of net foreign debt. So we've got the public sector or official government borrowing. So the federal, state and local governments borrowing overseas money to finance budget deficits. So that's the government's debt. And we've also got private sector or non-official borrowing, which is like companies or banks who use foreign money to finance their expansion or spending overall. Then we've got net foreign equities. So net foreign equities is all about so net foreign equities is all about assets rather than debt. So assets being something that essentially pertains to wealth, things that are owned by either Australians overseas against what overseas people own in Australia. So net equity obligations stem from foreign ownership of Australian assets, such as property and shares, minus the Australian ownership of foreign assets. So what foreign entities own in Australia, so land, property, businesses, et cetera, against what Australians own in terms of property, shares, et cetera, overseas. So in simple terms, it's the difference between the value of Australian assets owned by foreigners and the value of foreign assets owned by Australians. With net foreign debt and net foreign equity, in terms of how it has appeared in exams over the last decade, it's pretty vague. It tends to be the definitions, what it is, or how economic conditions would affect the overall level of it. So when the economy is slow, net foreign debt tends to rise as the government may need to borrow more money to finance by selling government securities to finance investment in the economy. Um, but for the most part, it's basically what is it? And if you can do that, you are going to be on the right track. Then we have the terms of trade. So the terms of trade is where things get a little bit more difficult. The terms of trade is essentially an aggregate demand factor that is a ratio of the average prices received for Australian exports relative to the average prices we pay for imports and is measured using an index of export and import prices over a number of years. One of the most important things about the terms of trade is that we assume, we need to assume, so we need to assume that quantities are constant. So quantities remain the same. Uh, constant. So what that means is even though prices may be changing, when we are looking at the terms of trade, we're assuming that the demand is still the same. So when we look at the terms of trade, it gives us a score basically where 100 is where export prices and import prices are exactly even. If we are above 100, it means that export prices are higher relative to import prices. That relative to is really, really important because sometimes you might not know the value of both numbers. And if export prices increase, that doesn't necessarily mean that import prices haven't also increased the same or more. So it's always really important to use that word relative. That is incredibly important in the terms of trade. So essentially this ends up giving us a score where 100 is just even. If we are above 100, that is really favorable for aggregate demand. And why that is, is because that means that relative to imports, we are receiving more for our exports because demand is the same, if the prices go up and we're getting more money for them, that means we're gonna get more credits coming into the country, which is really positive 
for aggregate demand there's more injections coming in and therefore that's likely to increase production however if it falls below 100 that's bad because it means more money's going out of the country because we're paying more for imports so that is going to be negative for aggregate demand so causes of changes in terms of trade can be things like changes in the level of demand for imports or exports so during the pandemic um, on the mining boom even just right now there has been an intense amount of demand for Australian commodities especially iron ore and it's relatively inelastic in demand the price has been driven up by the amount of demand for it and so because we've had surging prices for what, one of our major exports it has meant that the terms of trade has risen a whole lot because our exports have been worth a lot more by comparison another one is changes to the exchange rate so if the exchange rate appreciates so if we have an increase in the Australian dollar automatically exports are worth more so that's going to increase the export price index um, and it's going to decrease the import price index automatically and that's going to lead to an increase in the terms of trade in the short term I know what you're thinking already you're thinking well if the Australian dollar appreciates then people are going to demand less for our exports that is true but with the terms of trade we're thinking that all things remain equal ceteris paribus quantities remain constant so if the Australian dollar increases we're assuming that just means that export prices are higher and import prices are lower and therefore the terms of trade has improved or risen if there's a depreciation of the Australian dollar the exact opposite happens when the Australian dollar depreciates our exports are worth less and our imports cost more and therefore the terms of trade falls so if we were to look at a few kind of effects of changes in the terms of trade on living standards increase in the terms of trade are seen as great because more than 50 percent of our exports are commodities as we have been saying a lot recently which means an increase in their value is seen as a great demand side condition because people continue to demand them even when the prices rise and therefore that's great for aggregate demand it's great for economic growth it's great for unemployment because it's going to mean that production continues to rise more than 50 percent of our imports are manufactured capital so machinery etc technology that we need for production which is relatively inelastic as it's not available in Australia this means that when import prices fall it's greatly beneficial to our production costs because we can get more of that manufactured capital from overseas cheaper lowering our production costs and therefore maximizing our production so the very last thing we're going to do is if we were to look at how the terms of trade has been going recently it has been rising quite a lot so the terms of trade was below 100 during some of the pandemic but has since shot up it reached historic highs of 144.2 um, during September of 2022 and has now fallen to 135 which is still really really positive of an aggregate demand side condition once again that 135 means that on average we're receiving more for our exports relative to what we are paying for our imports and that's it for net foreign debt and the terms of trade and a little bit of a recap of the balance of payments I hope this has been helpful if you have any questions or comments at all feel free to shoot a comment below or email me sean at the running economy.com a very special shout out at the end of this video to Maurice and Garan who I taught this year who bought me a very very wonderful Lego set of a starry night by Vincent van Gogh which I'll be building very very soon so thank you for that have a good and wonderful day I'll see you next time goodbye